Hello everyone, what is going on? Raven here, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're talking about a very interesting story. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually heard of this woman before. I've heard of her a few times, but I never did a video about her and I don't know why. So today we're talking about Dorothea Puente. Now, she was born January 9th, 1929. Now, why am I mentioning her? Well, because she was an American convicted serial killer. Now, here's the story. So, she, her parents are Trudy and Jesse. She had a traumatic upbringing. Her parents are alcoholics. Her father repeatedly threatened to commit suicide in front of his children. Her father died of tuberculosis in 37. And her mother lost custody to the, her children in 38 and died in a motorcycle accident by the end of the year. So she was sent to an orphanage, and it is said that she was abused. Now, based on this website, that's what it says. I haven't heard anything about that before now. I've heard of the main cause for her story. So, she got married when she was 16 in 1945 to a soldier named Fred McFowl, who had just returned from the Pacific Theater of World War II. They had two daughters between 46 and 48. She sent one child to live with relatives in Sacramento and placed the other up for adoption. And then she also suffered a miscarriage. Her husband left her in 48. In the spring of 48, she was arrested for purchasing women's accessories using forged checks in Riverside. She was charged and pled guilty to two counts of forgery. She served four months in jail and had three years probation. Six months she was released. She left Riverside. In 52, she remarried. She married a merchant named Axel Bren Johansson in San Francisco. She created a fake persona calling herself Taya Nayarda and claiming to be a Muslim of Egyptian and Israeli descendant. They had a turbulent marriage. Gray, you know, Dorothea, whose maiden name at the time was Gray, would take advantage of Johansson's frequent trips to sea by inviting men to their home and gambling away all of his money. She was again arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a brothel under the disguise of bookkeeping in Sacramento. She was found guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in Sacramento County Jail. Now, in 61, Johansson had, you know, Dorothea, committed to a state hospital after a binge of drinking, lying, criminal behavior, and suicide attempts. Doctors diagnosed her as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. He divorced her in 66, Although she would continue to use Johansson's name for some time following their separation. She assumed the identity of Sharon Johansson, hiding her delinquent behavior by portraying herself as a kind Christian woman. She established her reputation as a caregiver, providing young women with a sanctuary from poverty and abuse without charge. She then married Roberto Jose Puente. After six months, the couple separated with her citing domestic abuse as the main cause. In 67, she attempted to serve him with a divorce petition, but he fled to Mexico. The divorce wasn't finalized until 73. The two will continue to have a turbulent relationship. She filed a restraining order in 75, but she continued to use the surname Puente for more than 20 years. Following the divorce, she focused on running a boarding house located on 21st and F Streets in Sacramento. She established herself as a genuine resource to the community to aid alcoholics, homeless people, and mentally ill by holding Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and assisting individuals to sign up to receive social security benefits. I think we all know where this is going. She changed her public image to that of a respectable older matron by putting on vintage clothing, wearing large granny glasses, and letting her hair turn gray. She also established herself as a respected member in the Sacramento's Hispanic community, funding charities, scholarships, radio programs. She eventually met and married Pedro Montalvo, though he abruptly left the relationship only a week into their marriage. And in 78, she was charged and convicted of illegally cashing 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants. She was given five years probation 
and had to pay $4,000. Now, this seems kind of like it's not a big deal, right? Oh, this gets much worse. It is said she murdered nine people. Now, here's how the murders went down. In April of 1982, 53-year-old Ruth Monroe began living with her in her upstairs apartment. But she soon died of an overdose from codeine and acetaminophen. Puente told police that the woman was very depressed because of how her husband was terminally ill. They believed her and ruled the death a homicide. A few weeks later, the police returned after Malcolm McKenzie, age 74, who was one of the four elderly people that Puente was accused of drugging, accused Puente of drugging and stealing from him. In August of 1982, she was convicted of three theft charges and was sentenced to five years in prison. She began corresponding with Everson Gilmuth, a 77-year-old retiree from Oregon. They started a pen pal relationship, and, you know, she was telling him that, you know, she wanted to change her way. She didn't want to be a bad person anymore. So they continued to talk through a pen pal. Well, she was released in 85 after serving three of the five-year sentence. He met her outside of prison. The relationship developed quickly and the couple was soon making wedding plans. In November of 1985, Puente hired a man named Ismael Flores who saw some wood paneling in her apartment. For his labor and $800, she gave him the, the red Ford pickup, which her then soon-to-be husband was driving, which she stated belonged to her boyfriend who was in Los Angeles who no longer needed it. She asked Flores to buy a 6 by 3 by 2 foot box to store books and other items. She then asked him to transport the filled sealed box to a storage depot, and he agreed, and she assisted him. Now she told him to stop while they were on Garden Highway to dump the box of quote-unquote junk on the riverbank at an unofficial household junk dumping site. January 1st, 1986, a fisherman spotted the suspicious-looking box near the river and called the police. The investigators opened the box and found the badly decomposed and unidentified body of an elderly man inside. Puente continued to collect Gilma's pension and wrote letters to his family explaining the reason that he had not contacted them was because he was so ill. She maintained a boarding house, taking 40 new tenants. Gilma's body remained unidentified for three years. Now, suspicion for it was starting to arise when neighbors noticed the odd activities of a homeless alcoholic known only as chief, whom Puente stated she had quote-unquote adopted and hired as her handyman. She and she had him dig in the basement and cart soil and rubbish away in a wheelbarrow. The basement floor was covered with concrete slab, so he later dismantled a garage in the backyard and installed a fresh concrete slab there as well. Soon after that, he disappeared. Now, there's other people. There was a homeless man that we're going to call Pert was also living there because this was deemed a reliable boarding house. And he went missing as well. So the people that were helping him find a place to live was, they were very suspicious as to how he just up and disappeared. He had schizophrenia and other issues. And, you know, they were like, she went to the police and said, look, you guys need to search around this house. I have a bad feeling. I think she's lying because she would say that like, oh, his family came to to get him. <laughs> That's not true. So, we're getting to that now. On November 11th of 1988, police inquired the disappearance of tenant Bert Matoya. He was a disabled man with schizophrenia, as I've been said. He had been reported missing, again, like I said, by a social worker. Through noticing disturbed soil on the property, they uncovered the body of tenant Leona Carpenter, who was 78. Seven bodies were eventually found buried on the property. Now, she was charged with a total of nine murders. 
her boyfriend, Everson Gilmuth, who was 77, the eight tenants who lived at the boarding house, Ruth Monroe, Leona Carpenter, Alvaro, a.k.a. Bert Gonzalez Montoya, Dorothy Miller, Benjamin Fink, James Gelb, Vera Faye Martin, and Betty Palmer. These are all older individuals. They're all, except for Bert, who was the youngest, 51. Benjamin was at 55. Dorothy and Vera were 64. Ruth was 61. Leona was 78. James was 62. And Betty was 78. So they're all pretty much in the older side of years. According to investigators, most of her victims had been drugged until they overdosed. She then wrapped them in bed sheets and plastic lining and dragged them to open pits in the backyard for burial. During the investigation, she was not immediately a suspect, and she was allowed to leave the property, which she said she wanted to go get a cup of coffee at the nearby hotel to go meet up with her nephew. That was not the case. She actually fled to Los Angeles. She left Sacramento and went to Los Angeles. She befriended an elderly male pensioner who she had met in a bar. Unbeknownst to her, he recognized her as a woman he saw on television news reports. He contacted local law enforcement who arrested her immediately. So, this woman killed all these people by herself. She's an older lady herself. She killed all these people. Now, this Bert Montoya, he was a bigger man. So what I want to know is, first of all, why did she do this to all these victims? And second, how? How would you pull them to the outside without, number one, being caught? And number two, when you're so much smaller than a lot of these people are, how did, how? Like, how? I do, I do not undergird that. So her trial began in October of 92 and ended a year later. The prosecutor, John O'Mara, was a homicide supervisor in the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office. He called over 130 witnesses. He argued to the jury that Puente had used sleeping pills to put her tenants to sleep, suffocated them, hired convicts to dig the holes in her yard. Now the concluding argue, closing arguments showed a picture which was commonly used in trials and they were told like the jury and them were told keep in mind things are not always as they seem because she looks like an innocent old lady and her garden in the backyard looks like a old lady just tending her garden but in reality she was unstable and she committed all these horrible crimes now, I don't know if she actually paid people to do this to her backyard. Why would you want a bunch of criminals at your house? Like, how would you be able to do that? Like, how did you pay someone to do that? It is said she collected $100,000 from everyone's social security. Why would she sell that, give that money to someone to dig holes? So that tells me either, A, they're the person like this you know, site says they're criminals as well, or B, maybe she said she wanted, she had a contractor coming to do something to her backyard and she wanted to pay someone else to do the digging. Who knows? I mean, if she actually dug this herself, that would have been very important. Jury deliberated over a month and they found her guilty of three murders. The jury was deadlocked, 11 to 1 for conviction on all counts. It is said by those that were talking about it, because there's a, a show on Netflix you can watch about, you know, people that commit murders or commit crimes, things like that. It is said that the one person actually did not believe that this old woman could kill all these people by herself. So that's why it's called a deadlock, even though... Only one person did not believe, okay? So they finally agreed on a conviction of two first-degree murders, including special circumstances, one second-degree murder, and, of course, the deadlock for the rest. 
So the penalty phase of the prosecution was highlighted by prior convictions introduced by, you know, O'Mara. Now the defense did call several witnesses who showed Puente had a generous and caring side to her, including her long lost daughter testified how she had helped them in her youth and guided them to be in successful careers. Mental health experts testified of her abusive upbringing and how it motivated her to help the less fortunate. Yes, she brought people into her house and she did help them. That, that is very true. But she also murdered these people. That is not a good person. Yeah, she did not murder her own children. She gave the one up for adoption and, you know, so that doesn't really help much. But she still had evil in her, in her, you know? I, it just amazes me, you know, that people actually believe she was an innocent person when all the evidence, the fact that she fled when they were, when she gave them permission to dig in her backyard, she fled. That says I'm guilty. Okay. Just throwing it out there. Now, this is the conviction. She was convicted of three murders because the jury could not agree on the other six. So they were deadlocked 75 after days of deliberations for her sentencing. Now, it is declared a mistrial when the jury said further deliberations would not change their minds. So under the law, she received life without possibility of parole and was incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility in California. She, for the rest of her life, she maintained innocence, insisting that all of her, all of those that lived with her off the borders had died of natural causes. When there were so many medications all over the house, and even the homicide detective investigated the house and said that the only scent that he could find when he pulled up carpet was that of horrible decomposed bodies of bile and fluid from deceased that have never been cleaned up. That is not something an innocent person would leave behind. An innocent person that did not kill anyone would not leave all these bodies. She would have called the police and said, hey, this person, ha I came in and this person was dead. Right? Or am I just thinking stranger than what I should be? I don't, I don't get it. You know, if you fled from police, you left a bunch of dead fluid from bodies in your house and you're claiming innocence. Anyway, we don't need to worry about her because not only did she receive without possibility of parole, so she was going to spend the rest of her life, and she was older at this time, uh, in jail, she actually has already died. She died on March 27, 2011. She was 82, and it says she died from natural causes. Let me know what you guys think of this in the comment section down below. And I am also going to say this one thing. In 2015, the Ghost Adventures crew investigated the house due to reports of hauntings by the victims and of Puentes herself. And it is said that, actually, if you did watch that episode, which I did, um, they took psychics to the house. And they actually, they said they made sure that they didn't know anything about the case or anything like that. How would they not have known about the case? That's what I don't get. It was all over the... the the TV, everything. I don't know. You guys will have to watch that episode and tell me if you believe it or not. I don't believe that the psychics did not know about this beforehand. But that's just my opinion. This video is very long, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it here. If you guys like this video, let me know in the comment section down below. Also, let me know if you guys think that she was guilty or innocent. I think she was guilty. When you run and you leave body fluid in your house... That tends to make you guilty. And the fact that she kept doing the forgery long after these people have died. I think she was guilty. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Now, I'm not saying anything against her family or anything like that. This was just her doing this on her own. I will see you on the next video.
Bye.